land protection within our local headwaters region program today. The importance, importance of strategic land protection within our local headwaters regions presented by the North Oakland Headwaters Land Conservancy. This presentation will explore the importance of four local headwaters regions with a focus on the Clinton, Flint, Huron, and the Shiawassee River watersheds. We will delve into the unique ecological features of where these watersheds originate and why strategic land protection in these sensitive areas is so imperative. Susan Julia, Julian is here to talk about it in detail and she will explain to you everything and uh, I welcome uh, Susan. Susan is here. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask uh, through chat or question answer feature. And then we will answer all your questions at the end of the program. Thank you very much and welcome you all for this program. Thank you, Susan. Everything is yours now. Oh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm delighted to be here uh, speaking to uh, through a, a library invitation. I have to tell you, I met my husband in a library. My mother is a librarian. My first job was in a library. My sister is a librarian. So uh, to, to be invited by a library to give a talk on something that I'm very passionate about, I appreciate very much. Thank you very much for Allowing Thank you. Me. Thank you very much, Susan. And I we welcome you and go ahead. Okay. Um, strategic land protection. Apparently, it's being discussed by these two turtles right here. Uh, I'm going to discuss it with more of a, a lecture format. Um, in the United States, um, this movement to privately protect land, not using government uh, monies really, uh, began around Earth Day in 1972. And a lot of other good things started then. The Clean Water Act, you know, we had a movement for uh, clean air, um, pollution prevention, pollution identification. All of this started somewhere around 1972. And that's the year that our organization was founded. In fact, we really were the first conservancy in Michigan. But all across the United States, there's 2,000 or more conservancies that have sprung up since 1972. Um, and uh, altogether, these conservancies actually protect more land than the national parks. That's a, a detail that I learned about uh, maybe a year or so ago, and it surprised me. But if you go to, um, for instance, like Massachusetts, um, they have very large counties, but they're run by uh, individual municipalities, and, and I would say half of those small municipalities have their own conservancy. So it's not surprising that there are as many as 2,000 in the U.S. In Michigan, um, although we were first, uh, <laughs> we've been joined by more than 40 others. And as the movement has continued, um, an organization grew up in Washington that connects us all called the Land Trust Alliance. And uh, because there was a proliferation of, of conservancies, some of them in protecting land were not really above board. And so the IRS was unwilling to give us nonprofit status. And so the Land Trust Alliance said, if you meet certain criteria and we authorize that you are following all those criteria, we will accredit you. And then people who donate can be sure that their donations are going in the right direction. So in Michigan, although there are more than 40 conservancies, only 11 have been accredited by uh, the Land Trust Alliance. And we're one of them. We're, we're proud of that because, oh, it took us a lot of work. Uh, Although I'm a librarian, I want to tell you, you know, the amount of documentation and the number of binders and the number of places we uh, uh, back up everything, um, it was pretty overwhelming. Um, but we can now say to any of our private funders that um, anything they want, we're fully transparent, they can find out, we have it on file, we can send them that information. And we do get 
almost um, two thirds of our support from private sources. So the whole idea of land conservation, of preserving land um, is something that grows out of the a really long standing American tradition. And you're probably familiar with that. You may remember, um, you know, the work of Alexis de Tocqueville who came from France and was touring around the US. And one of the things he found that was peculiar or special, peculiar in a good way uh, about Americans is um, they're very neighborly and they formed a lot of associations, voluntary associations. And the whole idea of volunteerism has been around in our country for a long time. So we are largely a volunteer conservancy. I'm a full-time director, volunteer. I have other people working here who are part-time and they volunteer beyond their part-time, believe me. Um, but all in all, uh, it's an effort to try to preserve land for the future, to create that heritage going forward that's so important. And we have a, a board member who's an excellent videographer. So I want to show you his interpretation of celebrating Earth Day and of um, what it means to be a land conservancy. So bear with me, I'm learning how to switch gears here. So I think we will be up in just a second. Earth Day. Born out of concern for the Earth's environment in 1970, following the blowout of an oil platform off the coast of Santa Barbara in 1969 that spewed out 3 million gallons of oil, that was the tipping point. Earth Day is a global celebration and reminder that we need to care for the planet that provides for us. North Oakland Headwaters Land Conservancy is also a child of the 1970s. We're a community-based land conservancy in Northern Oakland County, working diligently for over 45 years to protect and steward land in the headwaters of the four major rivers that have their sources here and feed into the Great Lakes. By protecting and stewarding these headwater areas, we help to maintain a sustainable habitat, not only for ourselves, but for the many and diverse species that we share it with. know that this area is home to one of the last known areas on the planet where a particular species of butterfly can be found, the Powashik Skipperling. It's also home to other threatened and endangered species in Michigan, the Blandings turtle and the eastern Massasauga rattlesnake. Fringe gentian in live and wet meadows. Grass of Parnassus turn their white faces to the sun in fens. Mountain mint attracts buzzing pollinators. Did you know that the lands we protect help filter and purify your drinking water? Everyone in this area drinks groundwater.
Earth Day, a reminder to all of us that we need to work to protect this planet, our home, a global perspective with local action. Join us in celebrating Earth Day throughout the year as a volunteer or with a donation of support. As a supporter, you will be helping to preserve this beauty and diversity for future generations. Please help us to protect the unique character of the natural resources and the quality of life we are fortunate enough to experience in the little corner of the planet Earth that we call home. Okay. Okay. So I'd like to tell you some of the the um, I guess inside baseball about preservation, um, because um, al although there are two thousand conservancies across the United States, you'd be surprised if you go and talk to people in the street; they don't really understand what a conservancy is or how it works. So we preserve land by two methods here. You can see ownership and you can see easements. So um, we get land donated to us or sometimes we purchase it. Uh, I want to tell you that in this area, the cost of land is pretty high. So we aren't doing a whole lot of purchasing. We'd have to do a great deal of fundraising for that. And um, the land that we take on um, it may not be everybody's backyard because it has to meet our criteria as being something worthy of preserving, trying to spend time and money into the future because we promise that we will manage that land, create a plan to keep it in the condition as we receive it, actually to improve it as much as possible. And we promise that in perpetuity. I like to put that word out there. Um, perpetuity is a long time. So you might ask, why would people even give us land? Because a, a third of the lands that we manage have been given to us. And um, there are a couple of reasons. Um, I think the most common one is not financial. Uh, it's that people have lived on the land a long time. Uh, their friends, their family going back have owned the land. They want to see that protected. They want to see something going into the future for uh, generations to come. And secondarily, they may think that, okay, if I give land, I can write it off on my taxes, which is true. And I can get maybe a, a tax deduction in, in property taxes. But that's really not usually the motivation and nor is it the motivation in people who give us an easement. Now, <coughs> excuse me, um, those are people who, who continue to own the land and two thirds of our properties have easements on them. Um, so each one, <coughs> each one has an easement agreement that is um, written and recorded and remains there again, in perpetuity, so that the, per the people can live on the land. Um, maybe the agreement says you can cart off a little bit here and uh, your son and daughter can build a house there. Or um, this portion of land uh, uh, you want to see open to the public, but this other portion you don't want to. So each easement is very specific and our management has to uh, then agree with each of those provisions. And again, there are some tax incentives. Um, they can probably get a lower uh, property tax from the tax assessor because the land is no longer worth what the assessors call the highest and best use. Now, in my opinion, uh, a multi-story apartment building is not the highest and best use in every case. Um, but that's how land is usually evaluated and assessed. So we talk to people if they want to preserve land, it, would they care to donate? Um, do we need to partner together, especially in terms of the future management? 
and what is the owner's purpose for the future. We have a couple other uh, preservation methods too. Um, we have a called working lands. The picture you see here is a farm that we're protecting. And this is a seventh generation farm. Uh, they hope to pass it on to future generations, but in the agreement, um, they are saying that if they can no longer maintain it as a farm, um, it will then become open space, open to the public. So it again is a special agreement that worked out for a few places. Farms, uh, we have another place that's a nursery. We're looking at some other possibilities of working lands. And yet another um, method of preservation is to allow people, and this works from a tax point of view, from a financial point of view, for people who are older. They can live out uh, their lives on the land. They've given us the land earlier on, and then when both partners or whoever has been living on the land uh, passes away, then it fully becomes our land to manage. But during their lifetime, there's no um, indication that it's owned by a conservancy. There are no signs out front. They just are able to live out their life, manage the land in their own way, and then upon their death, give it to us. Which also brings up the idea of bequests. Some people leave us, leave us land, some people leave us money in their wills. And with funding in somebody's will, we are able to then go back to the purchase method of uh, acquiring land that is important to protect. So um, that's the inside baseball. Um, why would we do any of this? Well, uh, it has to meet our criteria. And here we have a couple of beautiful little uh, goslings there, the, the um, sandhill cranes babies. I think maybe you know that the sandhill cranes mate for life and they have one or two chicks. And um, if those chicks look unprotected, they, they are. Um, coyotes, any kind of animal when they're young, uh, sees them as a tasty morsel, but they've got very protective parents. So if we found a land that was protecting uh, really interesting animals, we would say that it, it would partly meet our criteria. But then we'd want to say, how big is the land? You may have heard of um, uh, the idea of edge effect. That's something that's a, a principle in ecology that says that where two different ecosystems meet, um, there's a blending of uh, different species that are there. But if you have a, a subdivision next to a small woodlot, um, the blending of the subdivision characteristics move into the woodlot. So unless you have a fairly big area, it's pretty hard to maintain the ecological value. We also rank each property um, if it has, uh, if it's adjacent to or contains part of a river corridor, we give it extra points. If it has rare species, we give it extra points. If it has the opportunity of being publicly accessible, we give it extra points. And uh, really an important thing for us, if there's some money uh, that will provide a stewardship endowment, we give it extra points. So um, I do have people calling and saying, I'd like to give you uh, my property to protect forever. And um, unfortunately, I have to say, I'm sorry, uh, an acre and a half of land is not something that we can promise to protect um, with uh, looking at the ecological value forever. Um, however, if someone would like to give us land, we have the final opportunity of possibly selling the house, garage, the land, and then using that money for other protection. So uh, how do we get to this area right here? I promised to talk about why this area is important and it really all goes back 13,000 years ago when the last uh, glacier was melting in this area. It's really hard to believe that, you know, when we look around us that it, this was covered with ice. When I say covered, I, I'm, I'm talking about really covered. If you imagine where you are right now and think of a place that's a mile away from you, that gives you an idea of a mile distance. Now turn that 
distance upright, and that's how thick the glacier was in Michigan, a mile thick. And you can imagine that that had a huge effect on the land. It wiped out all the life that was here before, and in Michigan, all had to start again after 13,000 years. And the, the glacier itself was so heavy that it actually pushed down on Michigan. And so Michigan is slowly, slowly rebounding like this at, at about a tenth of an inch per year. Doesn't sound like much, but we're talking about all of Michigan growing at that rate. In this particular area, something a little bit different happened. In other places, the, the glaciers um, started melting and then they started refreezing again. They kind of moved back and forth and they kind of ground down the land. So it was fairly flat. If you go to the center of Michigan, uh, you don't get um, what we have in this area here, which is called the interlobate region. What happened was the, the glaciers stayed in one place. They stagnated. They broke up, left blocks of ice around dropped a lot of the soil. You can imagine that that glacier coming down from Canada was pushing ahead of it a whole lot of soil, dropped it in place. And then when all of the ice melted, what was left behind were depressions uh, where little lakes formed called kettle lakes and canes, a really interesting feature. Uh, it's kind of like a, a, a pointed uh, mountain, like a volcano shape. And a river of water was coming through the glacier carrying sediment with it and pouring down like a waterfall and building up that cone. We're in the Clarkston area here and people go skiing on uh, Pine Knob. There's another one called Alpine Valley. Both of those were canes in this area. And so this particular region is really fairly unique in Michigan. It starts um, in Northern Oakland County and it kind of goes Southeast and goes down into Washtenaw and Jackson County. But we feel that this particular region uh, is especially important to protect. Sometimes those, uh, the glacier <laughs> created a disaster, you know, where we're fond of uh, horror movies where, you know, you have, uh, I don't know, volcanoes erupting and so on. But if you were around uh, when the glaciers were melting, sometimes great, huge pools, uh, lakes, formed and then would suddenly the, the ice would break and it would just dash out and everything in the way was swept along. And so we have today big outwash channels where water broke through and moved very rapidly. That of course affected the environment too. And all of these things have led to a high diversity of plant life and some pretty interesting scenic views where you have the um, high areas and the low areas. Um, there's a place about ooh, five miles from here where there are a series of cones in the ground. And um, I don't get too close to it because I'd probably just roll right down. It's so steep, but it's where water has continued, rainwater has continued to uh, uh, sink through the ground and create that very steep uh, cone shaped formation. Um, and in these areas, because of the high topography, they're relatively undeveloped. And that gives us a chance to say, maybe this is something to protect for the future. And the glacial till, that means all that stuff that the glaciers brought down and dropped here, uh, gives us special soil properties. So for a whole lot of reasons, mostly going back to the glacier, um, this is a special region in the headwaters of the Clinton, which runs through your area, the uh, Flint, which goes north to Saginaw Bay, the Shiawassee, which goes west and then turns suddenly toward uh, Saginaw Bay, and the Huron River, which is uh, ends up in Lake Erie. So we are part of that rebound where we're a high spot, doesn't look very high, but it's enough that four different river systems emanate from here and flow out. So here's what some of them look like. This is a fen, about four miles from where I am right now. 
and it contains really interesting and unusual um, species. On the right hand side, you're looking at fringed gentian. And on the left hand side, you're seeing the flower of, um, I'm going to blank now, um, a pitcher plant. Okay, it blooms for a short period of time. And the rest of the time, it's a carnivorous plant that catches flies, digests them, and eats them because it lives in an environment that doesn't have a whole lot of nutrients, the flies become extra uh, source of food for that plant. And we have some fairly unusual um, birds and mammals and all other kinds of creatures. Um, this is a, a, a eagle that's on one of our properties. We're watching, apparently it has babies. And uh, if we, it stays around for next year, we'll try to put up a, a critter cam and see if we can uh, show people the, the life and times of an eagle. And then there's some birds and flowers and plants that are just extravagant. You know what this one is? This is the male wood duck. And look what a display he puts on. So that's definitely nature worth preserving. That's our motto. And we have uh, even ecosystems that we feel that are worth preserving. So I'd like to introduce you to one ecosystem called a fen. It, it's a wetland. If you drove past, you probably wouldn't um, recognize it as being special. But if I walked there, I would see this thistle and I'd say, ooh, thistle. Yeah, but take a look very carefully. If you have walked across a field and touched a thistle lately, you'll know that that darn thing will reach out and scratch you, okay? But take a look at the leaves on in this picture here. They're very thin leaves. This is the native thistle, not the one that's so obnoxious that we find so much these days, which comes from Canada, Canada thistle, and does not really belong here. So you can find that in a fen. What makes a fen? Well, the water um, comes from rainwater infiltration. And uh, what I mean is, remember I was talking about the glaciers and the till, the rainwater goes through the ground and it picks up minerals, specifically calcium and magnesium. And that makes for a, a basic environment, an alkaline environment, not an acidic environment, okay? Um, there aren't many places that have this uh, arrangement of the geography so it's definitely a disappearing ecosystem. And if you look on maps for zoning, you'll find, oh, this is zoned for development. So we are hoping in this area that we can protect some of these before they get developed. Or another thing that we do is work with a development and say, okay, how about you work on the upland here? And that's where you can place your houses as long as next to this, you also preserve an area. And for that, developers can also get a tax deduction. So we try to work with development when it's going to happen uh, to protect these special systems. And now I want to mention the Powashik skipperling. And the reason I want to is because it's an indicator species saying it only grows in the fens around here. And uh, what we have is a tiny little butterfly. If you look at that, you can see on the right-hand side, you see the full black-eyed Susan, but on the uh, left-hand side of your screen, there's the power chic, very, very small, nectaring on the um, black-eyed Susan, and you can get an idea of the size uh, of this little thing that's struggling to exist. In this area, we have, um, only 78 individuals were counted last year by the scientists who worked out in the field. Now, that's pretty close to extinction. It used to be all over the place. In this slide, you can see the um, shaded area, and it was largely in the Dakotas and a bit of Minnesota and, and even through Iowa. In fact, the very lowest little spot in Iowa is in Powashik County. That's how the Powashik skipperling got its name. Um, but these days, the very uh, 
upper uh, left-hand corner she has an X in Manitoba. There are a few power chic left there. And in the lower right, there's the furthest right X. All the others uh, existed last year and they're now gone. So we only have two places on the planet where this power chic skipperling still lives. It's pretty sobering thought. You probably have read about um, the idea that we're in a sixth extinction, that throughout uh, the history of the world, there have been times when a number of species have been wiped out. This extinction is of our own making, unfortunately. But here's a prairie fen late in, an, in a property that we protect, and we're leading people out to see what the land looks like and what their dollars have actually helped to protect. And um, the butterfly lives in there, but could only be seen for a short period of time. Um, it's in the flying stage. The butterfly flies for about uh, two weeks, end of June, beginning of July. And then it fairly quickly lays eggs and they develop into larvae, caterpillars, right? Now, uh, this is a standard butterfly cycle. But for the power sheik, they stay in the larva stage all the way through winter. And only just uh, the beginning of June do they form a chrysalis for eight, nine days, something like that, and then hatch back out into the adult stage. So if we're trying to preserve this butterfly, we have to be aware of all of these stages and the length of time that they spend there. So if, if you went out, if I tried to take you out today to see the, the um, power chic skippling, we, we'd only find little caterpillars and it'd be pretty darn hard to find them too. So the scientists are out there with butterfly nets and they're counting equipment. And um, for you know three to 10 days between June and July, they count as many as they could find. And the tally last year, as I told you, was only 78 in this area. And then another maybe 40 possibly in Manitoba. So internationally, this is one of the fastest declining species. Look at the size of the egg. That's a tiny little leaf. Here's the caterpillar that blends right in with the leaves. And here are the possible plants where we think uh, the caterpillar spends most of its life and where the adults lay the eggs. Now, the reason I say we think is because there's just not much known about this butterfly. It used to be so common. Some of you have gardens and you know that you have the that really annoying um, a cabbage white butterfly. And they're everywhere. Well, the Powashik skipperling used to be everywhere too. And the scientists didn't bother to find out much about it because it was gonna be around forever. But now we know that they are declining and declining in incredible rapidity. I mean, when a species disappears in the matter of, um, Two dozen years, you really do have to pay attention. What's causing the decline? Well, we are implicated. The picture on the left is uh, uh, pretty close to our office, and um, it used to be all open land and forest, and it's been built up. We do, you may see a little red spot there. We protect the forest that's just north of that, but it's such a small little bit of forest that it's not gonna do much for the power sheet. On the right-hand side, we find uh, monocultures, okay, in, in the farmland. It, of course, that is the way to produce um, more grains, more um, food from the land, but um, farmers nowadays with larger equipment want to plow from edge of field to edge of field, and they're not leaving any little space for anything except the crop that they're trying to plant. But here is probably the main reason why this particular species is declining. Um, there's been a new class of insecticides, and I hope none of you are buying these and using them in your own yards. They're called neonicotinoids, and you hear the word nicotine in there because that's the main active ingredient. And, and just as nicotine is horrible on people's lungs, 
uh, it's even more horrible in the concentrated form used in insecticides, it paralyzes the breathing of all the insects. And if you look at a map of the increasing use of the neonicotinoids, you'll find the reverse decline of the Powashik skipperling. So that is a major reason why all of that central part of the United States that used to have the Powashik uh, has almost none left. In fact, we can say as of this year, there are none left. The word for it is extirpated. Okay. But right where we are, we don't, right here in the center of Oakland County, in that interlobate region, it's not very good for agriculture. So we don't have a lot of people using neonicotinoids. But we do have a problem with invasive plants. And I think everybody has this. If they have any part of their land that they're trying to keep that's wild, um, this is narrow leafed cattail. Yes, there have been cattail here forever, but not this kind. This kind comes from Europe. It blends with our current uh, broadleaf cattail, the native cattail, and it just totally fills up the area. And the plants that the butterflies need to nectar on, the places, the host plants where they want to um, deposit their eggs, gone, filled with invasive plants. And of course, we have agriculture and development trying to channelize and get water off the land because the thought is that get it off quickly, it'll be better for us, not better for wildlife. So what can we do? We try to protect habitat. Um, this is an area that was protected by our local township and we're very grateful that they have done that. Um, we uh, purchased this land right here, seen in green. Um, the township had a little bit more money. They were able to protect more acres, but we are now hoping to add uh, the area in yellow. So we're in a campaign to protect land uh, for the power chic skipperling, but the land and the ecosystem together are both important. So what do we do? One of the things that we do is uh, burn the land early in spring when the caterpillars are hiding down right in the crowns of the plants. And when the, this burn was done in late February, I think so, maybe early March, there was still ice on the ground. And all it did was clear um, the duff, all the stuff that was on the top, um, left over from last year, several years of plant growth. And it helped to kill the bushes because a fen is an open area. And the power chic skipperling itself, you know, it, it barely flies along. It has a pretty weak flight. And if it can make it three feet off the ground, that's about it. So um, a hedge of, of uh, bushes uh, makes it very difficult for them to survive. So doing a prescribed burn, you're welcome to see one if we do one in the future, let us know, we'll, we'll let you come and watch. Pretty interesting to watch that fire move across the ground in a very controlled fashion, burning against the wind and um, just removing what's on the top uh, that has been growing before, but not baking the soil, not killing the animals that are underneath. And we have sometimes people out with backpacks specifically looking for um, invasive plants and spraying only that plant to try to kill that and not kill all the rest of the uh, plants in the fen. But there's yet another or a couple other methods of possibly trying to keep these butterflies alive. Um, the people from the Minnesota Zoo have been coming here for um, several years and capturing um, some females and then uh, <laughs> going to a local motel and waiting for a few days to see if they will lay some eggs. <laughs> and then they've been taking them back to the zoo. I, I laugh because I can imagine people, you know, drinking for too much coffee and waiting <laughs> for those butterflies to lay their eggs. Um, taking them back to the zoo and then raising them in an environment where there aren't predators, you know, um, dragonflies, um, birds, all kinds of things um, would be very happy to eat uh, caterpillars. And then the idea is to return them to this property. Uh, that's called captive rearing. Um, unfortunately, 
because we don't know a whole lot about the power sheik, we don't really know all the proper methods uh, for captive rearing. And the first year uh, when they um, took eggs back, they were able to return two adults. Uh, last year, they were able to return 14. Now, that's hardly making a big difference in the population. And unfortunately, um, if in this next year they're counted again and the um, numbers are down, it may be that um, that zoo or another zoo will come and try to capture all the remaining um, of power sheep butterflies in the world, take them to the zoo, try to rear them in captivity, and that it's up to us on the land to keep the right environment so eventually they can be reintroduced. It's something that I think you ha may have visited zoos and know uh, that they have gotten into that idea of uh, through protecting them in a, um, you know, an artificial environment, but allowing them uh, to procreate uh, may actually be able to keep a species alive. Uh, Detroit Zoo does that. Um, the John Ball Zoo in Grand Rapids is considering it. Um, it is possibly one other way of keeping the species alive. But remember that our interest is in protecting the land and the power sheik is important, but we are more invested in trying to keep the ecosystem going. So what can you do? Well, we're always looking for donations. We're hoping to purchase that additional land. I showed you that it was marked in yellow. We really appreciate people who volunteer to come out and help and do habitat restoration. Either uh, planting seeds with the kind of um, plants that would be helpful to not only the power sheep, but all kinds of um, animals, especially other insects. And then removing invasive plants. What we prefer to do is uh, get out there with loppers and just cut them right down. And that's work we do in the fall. And then at the stem that we've cut, we may paint it with um, uh, glyphosate which is a, the main ingredient in Roundup. We don't recommend Roundup because it's got other stuff in it that's harmful, but the glyphosate itself will get sucked down to the roots and will kill those invasive plants. And then we're gonna ask a lot of people to come and help us with seed collection. Uh, the Pollinator Partnership, which is national, um, wants, uh, they, if we collect seeds, we can send the seeds to them. Uh, they will sort them for us, which is kind of a chore and um, they'll actually start growing some and they'll give us back the plants uh, to replant. And the important thing that I want to say to all of you is take action on your own property to increase insect diversity. You are all uh, interested in uh, books and what you can read, so I want to recommend Bringing Nature Home by Doug Tallamy. And his concept is that individually on our own property, we can slow down, possibly even reverse this sixth extinction if we all plant uh, native plants that can be used by all of the insects, which feed all the birds, which feed the hawks <laughs> and so on. We'll be supporting that web of life. So thank you very much for letting me uh, talk about these things. And um, I'm here to answer any questions if you have any. Okay, I'm not sure nobody has uh, posted any questions so far, uh, Susan, but it's a wonderful presentation and wonderful information, very educational. And we, I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you very much for doing this for our community patrons. Thank you. Hope everybody liked it. I don't see any questions. Let me see if they have anybody. No? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, look up our website, uh, www.nohlc, stands for North Oakland Headwaters Land Conservancy. Uh, and uh, you'll see what kind of things we're doing. And uh, whether it's St. Clair, Macomb, anywhere around here, we certainly welcome help in protecting this special region. Thanks again. Oh, there is one. Okay, one minute. Sure. Could you repeat the author's name, Doug? 
Doug Tallamy, T A L L A M Y. And the name T. of T is Thomas. Thomas. T A L L A M Y. Doug Tallamy. Mm -hmm. He's a. Um, 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 <laughs> I'm saying ornithologist. He's an um, invertebrate um, researcher at University of Delaware, and he has a whole number of students uh, that are working on trying to see what are the best things to plant to bring back the insect diversity. And he, what he found was the very best uh, plant is the oak tree, uh, that it supports um, about 400 and I think 35, I think, maybe 85, I'd forgotten, uh, different kinds of caterpillar on a single oak was counted. So plant oaks. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Susan. I really appreciate one more time and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you all of our attendees for attending this program. Have a good evening and stay safe. <laughs>